here you see archaeologists and scientists unpackaging the sarcophagus of King Tutankhamun, also known as King Tut, one of the most legendary, most sought after, most publicized of the Egyptian king's mummies that were ever found. But did you know that King Tut, the opening of King Tut's tomb, came with a curse that supposedly killed a few people? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today as part of 31 Days of Halloween here on Keto and Crime. This video is brought to you by our brand new full channel partner, Keto Crisp. The wonderful folks over at tastecando.com have officially signed on to partner with me in both my weight loss journey, which I am back on now, as well as sponsoring the channel. They have signed me up for a brand new affiliate program. So if you click the link down below, as well as put in my uh, discount code, you'll receive 15% off your first order, and I do get a tiny commission if you do purchase. So it helps the channel, and you get something tasty and healthy. These are great bars. They satisfy. They keep you full for a long time. They have a lot of great nutrients, a lot of great natural ingredients. And for those of us in the keto and low-carb world, we've often been demonized as a not a friend to the animals, uh, but these are 100% plant-based. So you can feel good about that too if you are of the vegetarian or vegan keto lifestyle. You, these are also for you. So with that being said, I want to say a huge shout out to Keto Crisp for sponsoring the channel and helping me to stay on the air here. And thank you all. So if you'd like to order some, definitely check them out below. I appreciate it. Hey everyone. Welcome to Thought Crime, Keto and Crime. Today we're starting a new series to go along with my normal true crime and cult watch. Today we're starting something I'll come out with ever so often called Mystery History. And today we're going to look at, and by the way, my wife hates the fact that I feel the need to rhyme everything that I give to you guys. So if if you like the rhyming, smash the like button. If you don't, smash the dislike button. I just want to see who who enjoys the fact that I feel the need to rhyme everything. So if that gets on your nerves. yeah. Also, I want to thank people that have started sending me a couple of tips on PayPal and Cash App. You'll find both of those links below. It really goes far. I'm starting a fund to try to upgrade my webcam and some in my video editor and some things just to make things pop a little bit more for you guys. But in any case, you don't have to. That's never required, but it's always appreciated. And I am truly grateful for everyone that watches every single video I do, whether it's here on YouTube or here on BitChute or here on Library or uh, that listens to me um, on all the eight streaming services my podcast is on. You are all truly, truly appreciated. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. So let's get into mystery history with our very first one, The Legend of King Tut. King Tut was born Tut and Cotton. He had two names, one when he was younger, one when he became king. But Tutankhaten, around 1345 BC or BCE, he was the son. <clears throat> excuse me, he was the son of the uh, Pharaoh Atencaten and an unknown concubine known only as the younger lady. Now. Atten Cotton was a controversial pharaoh that we're going to talk about. He basically took Egypt off of the polytheistic Egypt. Had always, like a lot of countries in the Middle East at that time 
had been very polytheistic. They worshipped many different gods. But he kind of changed that and pushed everyone towards a more monotheistic religion, kind of like is kind of prevalent now, you know, with the Abrahamic religions, of Noten, the sundial god. So basically, he had the people of Egypt worshipping the sundial. And like most pharaohs before him, he took on the personification of a god. He said that he was descended from a god. He is a god representative on earth. And he took that for Noten, therefore his name, Akhenaten. And the younger lady was most likely a... So, she was most likely a half-sister of Akhenaten, but we don't really know her name. We have traced through remnants of DNA between Akhenaten, Tutankhaten, and the younger lady. And Akhenaten and the younger lady are both in the Valley of the Kings, tombs 35 and 55. You'll hear me reference that a lot. The Valley of the Kings that we're talking about is near the former capital city of Thebes, which is where Tut was born and where Akhenaten was born and where he reigned until he actually moved the capital to another city named after himself. Like I said, he was a very controversial pharaoh or king. And they were able through DNA testing after Tut's sarcophagus was found and Akhenaten's and this younger ladies were found to do DNA testing that have basically parred down to these two as the most likely suspects for Tut's parents. However, we know from paintings in his tomb, and for those of you watching on video here to your right, you'll see the area of the tomb where his uh, actual mummy lied. You'll see um, his wet nurse by the name of Maya represented on the wall as having raised King Tut. They normally paint a history of the king or pharaoh that's buried in that in that tomb so that you kind of know who they were and where they were. And also, being able to remember your life in death is very important to the ancient Egyptians. So they would have had this painted as kind of a remembrance so that upon awakening in the world of the dead, the mummy or the pharaoh would be able to remember their old life. So they kind of put their, you know, that old saying, how you see your life flash before you when you die. The Egyptians meant that literally, and they put it there so that you could see. So his wet nurse Maya, who is buried in the royal tomb of servants in Sagara, who was another near the capital city, she was the one that actually raised King Tut. He was born as I said, 1345 BCE or BC, however you prefer to say that, he was the last of his royal family, of his immediate line, to rule during the 18th dynasty, which is part of the New Kingdom. And he ruled from 1334 BCE to 1325 BCE. The New Kingdom, if you look in the history of the Egyptian Empire, the New Kingdom is one of the time periods that it's broken down into it. Now, I know you see the way I have, for those of you watching on video, you see the way I have illnesses spelled. That's not a mistake. He had illnesses. It was, you know, kind of like when Walford uh, Brimley says diabetes. He's, he had illnesses. A lot of them. Plural. Multi-plural. Because... Being the product of incest, just like most royal family was, and particularly Egyptian royal family, had a lot of weird illnesses going on. He had a, let me list them all for you. King Tut, from both the, the condition of his mummy, the paintings of him, and all of the representations we have of him, as well as CT scans and post-mortem x-rays that were done of him, we have determined that he had a flat skull, which meant he probably was dropped as a baby. He had a cleft palate. He had, you know, his mouth was deformed. He had very, very buck teeth. And I can't say a word about that because I, I got, I got the buck teeth. And he also had very wide hips. The men 
in his family were known because of all the inbreeding to take on very feminine. They had a ailment known as, it was basically a gender dysphoria type, not like you hear about, you know, in relation to transgender people, but it was a physical dysmorphia that they had that actually made them have a more feminine appearance. So he had that. He had very wide hips. He was very short. He was only 5'6", and I mean short for a man. I'm almost 5'6", so he was about my height. He was, uh, he had flat feet. He had very weak, brittle bones, and he had suffered from malaria at least four or five times during his lifetime. So he was a very sickly boy, and he only grew, he only aged to be age 19. So he actually ascended the throne. He had as normal as a childhood as you could have in this time with those kind of illnesses. But when his father died, when he was nine years old, he actually ascended to the throne at the age of nine. Now, Tut, upon ascending to the throne, and when he ascended to the throne, he changed his name from Tut and Cotton to the commonly known Tut and Cotton that we know today. So he actually was married to his half-sister, who was the daughter of his father, Akhenaten, and his first wife, Nefertiti. Her name was Akhenesian, and she is found in Valley of the Kings Tomb 21. Uh, what those of you can see on video is the only remaining cast of her face that we can find or, or replica of his, her face. But we can piece together she probably was very attractive because her mother, Nefertiti, because we have some really well-preserved artifacts from Nefertiti, that her mother was quite a gorgeous, was quite a catch, uh, by all accounts, very Cleopatra Cleopatra-esque. She was born 1348. As I said, she was his half-sister. She was a few years younger than him. Actually, older than him. Excuse me, a few years older than him. And she was kind of a grand princess in that she was the daughter of the pharaoh and the high, the high queen, not a concubine as Tut had been. And uh, to get into the weirdness surrounding um, marriages in royal families in Egypt. Before she married her half brother, her when her mother died, she was actually married to her own father, Akhenaten, for a few years. And then when Akhenaten died, as tradition, the son married the widow. So there you go. He married his stepmama, who was also his half sister. And yeah, I'm not even going to get into like the twenty, the twenty levels of bizarre that is. And from all of apparent drawings, the drawings found on both of their tombs and things like that, they they enjoyed each other's company. They were seen many times in paintings, just like Nefertiti and Akhenaten were in their renderings, holding hands eating together, just basically enjoying each other's company. She would go out and watch him hunt because he was an avid chariot hunter. We do know that about him. In fact, he had several accidents while being in a, a chariot hunting. And so they, they were very much happy, as happy as an arranged marriage could be. They did have two daughters. Bo both were stillborn. One was stillborn when she was four months pregnant. The other was stillborn at the full nine-month term. And both of these mummified infants were found having gone through the same royal mummification as all royalty does. They were found in King Tut's tomb, buried with him. So there was reasoning behind that. We're going to talk about that. But their children were found mummified with their father. Their marriage would be fairly short-lived. They were married 10 years. And when Tut actually passed away, as is tradition, Akhenesin was passed to the next pharaoh, I, who was actually the father of her mother, Nefertiti. So this poor girl went from being married to her father, to her half-brother, and then to her maternal grandfather. 
And beyond that, we kind of lose track of her because she died shortly after that. As I said, Tut passed away at the tender age of 19. She passed away at the age of 26. All right, so for those of you watching on video, you can see here kind of all of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty and most of the New Kingdom. And you can see Tut was almost at the end, followed by his grandfather, well, not his grandfather, his step-grandfather, I, who only ruled four years, and then the final pharaoh of that line, Herninabib. So, basically, during Tut's reign, he started to reverse many of the controversial policies that his father, Akhenaten, had put forth. Mainly, he moved the capital back from Akhenaten's new city back to Thebes, where it had always historically been. And he kind of tore down the monotheistic moniker that his father had put up, whereas he took... Egypt away from the worship of only the sundial, not to returning back to their polytheistic history. He basically had to fight a holy war when he became king because there was so much unrest, not only among the people, but of the under the clergy and the priesthood of this new type of religion that Akhenaten had in, installed. So he basically reversed all of that, reversed everything that his father had done, and tried to return the country to some being a peace. Beyond that, we don't know a whole lot about his life. M most of what we know, most of the history we know is about his death. So let's get into that. When Tutankhamun died, as I said, he was only 19 years old. He died around 1324 BCE. He immediately went into the Egyptian process of mummification as most high order royals did. Now, because of the deeply held religious feelings of the Egyptians, there were certain things that had to be done. Once a king or queen died, you literally had 70 days for their, them to be totally encased in their tomb with everything they were taking to the afterlife with them, or they would face some sort of punishment in the afterlife. Now, because he died so young, it is speculated that his tomb was not yet complete. So, basically, it was a hurry-up job. The tomb that he was buried in was most likely created for a queen or a woman of high standing because of its smaller statute and some of the things inside of it. Many believe that because his own tomb was not completed, the royal grave diggers decided to complete one that was already completed and just recomplete it for him. They went in there, they quickly painted the scenes of his life, they started moving his possessions in there. It even goes down to the sarcophagus he was buried in, the head plate that we know as Tutankhamun's today. It was, if you actually look at the statue, stature of it, it was actually probably originally created for a woman of high stature. But again, he was small, and he was young, and he also had very feminine features because of the body dis physical dysmorphia that his family had. So basically, they took something that was already ready and waiting for this royal woman and, and prepared it for King Tut. They had to do that because they only had 70 days. And among many of the artifacts moved into the tomb, you had... The mummified corpses of his stillborn daughters with his queen. And there was a very distinct reason for that. Because in Egyptian religion and hieroglyphics, particularly from the New Kingdom, women are often portrayed as protectors. And they really thought that it would allow the young king who died way before his you know, time, according to their religion, that having his two young daughters with him, he would not only have company in the afterlife because they would have new life breathed into them, but they would also serve as protectors and kind of win him points with the gods because they were sort of afraid that because his father had shown dishonor to so many of the gods besides the sun god that he would face some punishment for that. So sending his two daughters was kind of a way to win brownie points. The process of mummification normally begins with the removal of the vital organs, the brain, the liver, the heart, the intestines, all of these things are removed and they are all preserved in their own small container 
within the burial chamber of the king. Everything, once all that's removed and the blood is removed, basically the body is put through a drying process with salt and precious herbs, and it's stuffed with herbs and minerals to keep it fresh. And then it's sewed up, wrapped in the traditional mummy linen that we know, that we know of, and then put inside a three-tier coffin. There's the actual sarcophagus that houses the actual mummified body. Then there's an outer covering, and then there is a very outer covering that is protected. It's basically a very large vault, like you would see a person buried in today, a vault. And then underneath that is a lower vault, and then you have the actual head plate, the sarcophagus that we know underneath that, and that actually contains the mummy. One of the many mysteries that surrounds King Tut is what actually happened to him. He was found with a injury in the back of his head, a hole. It looks like perhaps many people thought because of that he could have been murdered. But upon being extracted by Dr. Howard Carter, which we're about to talk about, and all the tests done on him, it was determined that that was probably done during mummification. It was done post-mortem. So it, there was no way to indicate that he had ever been murdered. According to all of the CT scans and things that were done, he did have a broken leg that had been done very shortly before his death. And because of his bouts with malaria and everything else that was gone wrong with him, many believed he was just in a weakened condition, suffered a broken leg that took further strain on his immune system, and he just died because he was a very sickly man. So that's the that's the accepted theory, and when I say theory, I'm talking about a scientific theory, not just a good, good guess, but from all the evidence we can piece together, he died of an accident and then the stress put on his body. Also in, in the tombs were put everything, because they didn't consider life after death any different than life during life. He, he was buried with everything he would need, money, his chair, his bed, his chariot, uh, weapons, uh, games, everything that he would have enjoyed in life he was that he was buried with. So you had several rooms of just filled with his treasures and his memories that he would need in the afterlife. Also were several small statues that resembled the king that were very miniature. They had different tools in their hands. And what these were, these were servants that once the king awakened in the afterlife, he could recite an incantation that they were all taught from an early age that would actually cause these servants to come to life, and he would have people to protect him and to wait on him in the afterlife. So his life, he was still going to live like a king in the afterlife, according to their religion. So, as I said, they probably prepared, and for those of you watching on video down here to the lower right, that is the area where King Tut's tomb was discovered. That's the stairway going down. And so they basically filled him filled him up, put his a mummy in there, and then they sealed him up and then buried the staircase leading to his tomb to prevent grave robbing, which was very prominent during Egypt, especially in the Valley of the Kings. People would break into tombs all the time and steal the gold. Now, his tomb remained hidden. For many, many years until a young explorer by the name of Howard Carter, this is him top right for those of you on video, he was the Indiana Jones of his time. He never married. His entire uh, life was dedicated to adventure, mainly in Egypt, trying to uncover undisturbed tombs. He really believed there was an undisturbed tomb of pharaohs out there, and he wanted to find one. So he started looking for patrons, and he found one, somebody that would finance a dig for him in the Valley of the King. And he found one, George Herbert. Down here, he was English royalty. He, he agreed to finance Howard Carter's expedition. They started in 1907, but were interrupted by World War I. After World War I ended, they came back to Egypt and continued to dig. They dug for many years, year-round, and every year they came up empty-handed. It was just before Thanksgiving 1921 when George Herbert called Howard Carter back to England and told him that he no longer had the money to finance this and he was going to have to end the dig. 
Howard Carter convinced George Herbert to give him one more year. And if nothing is found in one more year, he'll give it up. Herbert said, okay, I'll give you one more year. After one more year, nothing were done. He went back and then it took him until almost the same time the next year. He had almost given up and a young Egyptian water boy. So the story goes, a young Egyptian water boy was uh were bringing some of the diggers water he walked past a certain area of the dig tripped and dislodged what looked to be a hidden stone he basically he turned around grabbed it tried to pull it out when he saw that it moved and there might be something under it, he started screaming mr carter mr carter come here howard carter ran over he got a team on it they removed the stone and after a few minutes they revealed a hidden stairway going down they dug their way down and got to a door sealed by mud with a royal seal on it he also saw where it looked as though possibly grave diggers had broken through at one time and then sealed it back so he kind of his heart kind of dropped he thought at first it might be an undisturbed tomb but then he's realized oh crap somebody's already gotten into it but still it was something he immediately went to cairo sent a telegram to England to George Herbert and told him he needed to come quickly. George Herbert and his wife immediately rushed to Cairo. George Herbert ran, at, ran immediately to uh, the Valley of the Kings to see what was to be seen. Finally, this was still within that same week, around November 26, 1922, when Herbert arrived, he followed Howard Carter and his assistant down the stairs and ceremoniously howard carter took ate some tools that he had been saving for just this time and he used them to actually dig through the mud seal on the door and crack it open he then lit a candle and stuck the candle in so that he could see at first he they said he was disappointed because he didn't really see anything but after all the dust settled thousands of years of dust and the room lit up he started seeing diamonds gold silver and other things within the room mr herbert asked him do you see anything and famously howard carter said yes wonderful things i spent so many centuries ago 33 centuries had passed since human feet last trod the floor on which we stood and yet the signs of recent life were around us a half-filled bowl of mortar, a blackened lamp, the chips of wood left on the floor by a careless carpenter. And they broke the door completely open, went in and found the first chamber of what we know as Valley of the King's Vault number 62, the grave of King Tutankhamun. There was three rooms, lots of artifacts. They began what was months of excavation carefully removing that they also had to deal with the Egyptian government what to do with it and they began to slowly remove the stuff and send it to the museum in Cairo to be looked at it was months almost a fact year almost a year later in late 1923 before they ever reached the inner tomb and found King Tut's actual body and were able to perform the tests that they did to try to determine a who he might be and what his cause of death was however a sad sad ending to the story is that george herbert never got to see king tut's body because on april 5th 1923 he passed away from a staph infection and complications of pneumonia he had cut himself shaving a few days before had opened up a mosquito bite that became infected he was already in a weakened state from having suffered from pneumonia and some other things and he did die of set of a septic shock on april 5th 1923 now you're probably thinking about king tut's curse and yes there were a couple people associated with the king tut excavation that did die as well as there has been other people associated with other excavations of other tombs in the valley of the kings tombs that had long since been disturbed and robbed that died from ancient bacteria and fungus was not a curse it was just some ancient bacteria that our bodies 
weren't used to that attacked and also you're talking about the 1920s we only had we only had penicillin and it was in its early days so things happen uh, i would think if this discovery had been made in our century we would have went in there with hazmat suits and everything that we need respirators to avoid that type of infection but yes a few people did die from ancient bacteria and ancient fungus from opening these tombs but it was not a curse there were people associated that died nine years 20 years later but always of accidents there was no king tut's curse i'm sorry but uh howard carter did live to see the excavation of the tomb he also lived to fight a huge fight with the egyptian government who basically kept king tut's remains under lock and key in cairo can't really blame them and it wasn't until way after howard carter's death in march march 2nd 1939 he died of hodgkin's lymphoma a bachelor in london like i said he never married he was a original indiana jones in fact indiana jones is partially based on him he um it wasn't until the 60s when after a lot of pressure from other nations and from historical fanatics and things like that that egypt actually agreed to release the king tut collection on a national tour and it's been touring ever since so definitely google it if you want to see this i would love to see it it does tour the world from time to time so definitely check it out and that's our first mystery history the mystery of king tut i will put these out on uh, on occasion i hope you enjoy them this weekend get ready because we're going to dive into the west memphis three again i appreciate everyone thank you so much like comment share subscribe if you want to support me on patreon or through paypal cash app all that stuff's below never required always appreciated thank you so much guys and girls keto comic